It's spoiler in time, and today we are going to talk about the first two episodes of season three of Preacher, the second episode of season three of Deadwood, the movie What We Do in the Shadows, the movie Incredibles 2, and I'm Tom Merritt, my co-host Brian Brushwood, and I would like to welcome to the show Brian Ibbett from Coverville. Well, well hello again. Hello. See, now, I love it. I, I, yeah, I, I, I love having another Brian. I only have to give half the words. <laughs> So, Brian, let me explain to Brian that this See, is not the Cord problem Killers. With two Brian's. Yes. <laughs> Cord Killers is the show where we talk about how to watch things. This is the show where we watch the things and then get to talk about them. Yeah. One of the things we like to talk about is our silly movie draft game, the Summer Movie Draft. All right. All right. All right. Tom, talk to me. Just what how long do you Brushwood? think? I am $105 million ahead of Team John Trucker, and all they have left is Mission Impossible Fallout and The Purge. Uh, well, as if those two combined could Mission possibly Impossible make... Mission Impossible Fallout alone could never make $105 million total across its domestic gross run. Yeah, all right. So it's going to it's gonna run right past you. Behind them... So behind you is, uh, uh, what, $220 million is Team Night Attack, that's me. You have a chance, you have to make $220 million plus whatever else they make off of Mission Impossible Fallout. I'm, I'm not right? seeing that. Now, now you- You're getting that from Skyscraper and Skyscraper. Yeah, right? Just Skyscraper is not <laughs> oh. gonna make $250 million. I mean, I you'll still think. make some money off Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Uh, uh, may, okay, but, let's be generous and say 50 more, more dollars, or 50 more million dollars is yeah. in that tank. Uh, do you think Skyscraper has a chance to be a $200 million movie? It does. It has a chance. I'd say it's like a 15% chance. Can, can, can you talk about your experience of previewing I can't that tell movie? you what I thought about it until July 10th. <sighs> okay, why? what is the justification of that? No idea. <laughs> that seems like a bad idea. If it's a, <laughs> like That's what you do when a movie's bad, is you tell people to not talk about it. I couldn't say if that's true or not, Brian. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you my opinion. I think yeah. that's a cool name. It has two S's, a Y, at least one K. And uh, you know what else? It has a line in the trailer uh, that is also in the movie where he says, if you run, if you, uh, if duct tape doesn't fix it, you haven't used enough duct tape. <laughs> All right. <laughs> true fact about Skyscraper. No, I, I think Skyscraper has an outside shot. It could surprise Probably won't. Though. So here's the one place where I think there's really interesting speculation re remaining. How much money do you think Ant-Man and the Wasp is going to make? You saw the movie. Can you talk about how you enjoyed it? Yes, I could talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp. <laughs> they let me tell talk about it the very next day after I saw it. Um, <laughs> and it is great. Uh, it's funny. It is probably funnier than the original Ant-Man. Uh, so if you liked Ant-Man, you will like Ant-Man and the Wasp. If you didn't like Ant-Man, you might still like Ant-Man and the Wasp. I uh, and and it's blissfully free of too many connections to Avengers Infinity War. Right. There is a connection to tie it in so you don't feel like, oh, this is just floating off in space. But most of the movie, you don't even have to worry about that. You're just having a good time. Dude, I'm so happy to hear that. I was I was fairly lukewarm on the original Ant-Man, although I do owe it a second viewing. Uh, but it looked like Ant-Man and the Wasp is embracing the silly. It looks like it's embracing the video game uh, dynamics of mm -hmm. making oh, stuff yeah. small and big. And, you know, it felt like Portal or whatever. Yeah. No, it, it does have a lot of those video game aspects. And Michael Pena is allowed to be a lot funnier than he was in Ant-Man. Oh, wow. And he was, and he was funny in the first one, too. So... Is the second one uh, as much of a heist movie as the first one? Yeah. If there's if there's a negative about Ant Man and the Wasp, it's that the story is pretty mundane. Uh, it, okay. it is a it is a heist gone wrong story uh, with a villain and a villain uh, <laughs> all trying to go after the same thing, uh, okay. and they're trying to save. And I think this is apparent from the trailer they're they're mm -hmm. trying to save michelle pfeiffer's character right they're trying to see if right. she's still out there in the quantum realm somewhere and if so can we bring her back uh okay so what what uh movies or tv shows do we want to move on to next oh uh yes okay so let's start with incredibles 2 uh take it away brian yeah and this will be a true spoiler in time because tom we're gonna spoil the movie for you guess what have Get you ready, seen tom. have you seen incredibles 1 
I have. Yes. I hope you really enjoyed watching Incredibles two. Can I can I can I start off talking about okay, yes, Incredibles two? Yes. I I've mentioned before. I've only seen bits and pieces of Incredibles. Oh, you've not seen the I had, whole first movie. Right. Okay. I had seen little bits about it. I kind of got this plot, and I really enjoyed Incredibles two. I I went in and they ta- they set the table very well of of who the family is and the dynamic, uh, and really pack it full. Like it felt like a fast movie. I will I will point out that Incredibles two and uh, Brian you watched it as well right mm-hmm. so right. Uh, yep. Incredibles two I think succeeded on a a cinematic level in a way Incredibles one did not Incredibles one there were two phases there was the golden age of comics opening segment the first act was gorgeous and beautiful the colors were over the top and saturated then you entered into this silver age of the 1960s uh, the, the the first act in incredibles one is 1940s second act is 1960s feels more brady bunchy you get a little more uh, 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 uh kind of washed out uh colors lots of uh, teals and so on mm-hmm. but um incredibles 2 on the action sequences, specifically all surrounding uh, uh, Elastigirl, mm-hmm. uh, those were great standalone. They almost yeah. felt dark, gritty DC cinematic universe, uh, and it, it, at yeah. its best, you know, like like right. like uh, the the, the, the Dark Knight Batman trilogy stuff. And, like it was yeah. it was it mm-hmm. was great. The action and stuff, yeah. all that. I mean, even that sequence of her tracing the signal and getting into the apartment. And that yeah. fight and the weird, almost Faraday cage with all the LED stuff, like, it was great. Every single mm-hmm. action sequence felt interesting and unique for, you know, all of these characters have very specific powers. And putting them together in in ways that I think the Marvel movies try to do, but don't always take advantage of the superpower elements of it. Right. To show very unique uh, matchups, right? Like, even, mm-hmm. even like, the, the, the moment with uh, the Void at near the end where she's trying to catch... Uh, she's trying to throw Elastigirl up to the plane mm-hmm. and then try to catch both of them at the end with her portal powers. It's great. And and mm-hmm. that's not something you can always do with superheroes or uh, action sequences, action movies. The sure. uh, I, I, I'm going to kick it over to you, Brian, here in a moment. But I do want to say that uh, Elastigirl is the star of the show, right? I mean, it's like we mm. see we see her doing moves that technically I should have seen Mr. Fantastic do uh, th- 40 years ago in Fantastic Four, but instead they make her look and feel like Spider-Man at times. Uh, 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 it's 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 amazing. I, I really enjoyed the set pieces. I like, you know, Void. Her power is really a concept that we've only seen in video game pop culture in the last 10 years right. with, with Portal. And so mm-hmm. it's familiar and also very of the moment, but but it was super engaging. The applications that you saw, and yeah. I love the fact that they they did that they, fight that she does with Violet, and in just in that hallway, and they keep finding new ways for her powers and Violet's powers to, to conflict with each other. Right. Yeah, like Violet makes the little the little bubble shield, and so she makes a portable in the floor up to the shield. And I also really enjoyed, and and I wish I wish I had the aesthetic uh, ability to explain what it is I see about it, but um, uh, Void's facial structure is is very gender neutral like like she's sure. she's a and, female mm-hmm. but she has the strong jawline that you normally associate with a male superhero or well, whatever androgyn- uh, uh, androgynous and, and, a there was a lot of androgyny maybe that's what it is because uh, the word that popped into my mind and it can't be correct uh, 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 but but I remember thinking she looks so millennial but but that's not the right way to think about it <laughs> I kept it. thinking about her as K- Katy Perry the Katy Perry superhero but, <laughs> maybe so maybe so but there was something there was something at a, at, at a deep level that made me really appreciate the new crop of superheroes that they introduced as feeling very of the moment. Does any of this ring true with you, Brian? 100%. I love, uh, number one, love the the way they introduced these new characters that could almost expand into an incredible cinematic universe, an ICU, except that's not a really good name. Um, but you also have a situation where uh, here's a movie that kind of does what other sequel movies have done. First movie, you introduce the the characters. Second movie, you give them a baby to contend with and, and somebody has to be the new Mr. Mom kind of thing. And they do it so well. I know Jack-Jack was in the first film, but they do it so well in this one that it could have been like a uh, Mr. Mom, another great, you know, another example of this. Um, it could have been that sort of situation, but Jack Jack is such a great engaging character for being just a freaking baby that it's done super well. Like it's, it's, uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. I thought, cause that Jack Jack thing was a really big part of the marketing. And I thought that 
all those stories going to be turn you off. Predict- be pre- silly. Pretty predictable, right. but it's it's great. It's fun, silly mm-hmm. bits, and they all coalesce into okay. This is a baby with a lot of superpowers. Well, and and, and the highlight, of course, is the baby versus badger mashup. The raccoon, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the raccoon. <laughs> stuff. They, that was fantastic. Right. Right. Um, the uh, my beefs, my beefs, my beefs. Okay. Structurally utterly identical you have an opening first act that is completely self-contained that Mm -hmm. shows superheroes at the top of their game working together to do what superheroes do when they do it best then you have a break and then you have oh but in 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 the first movie it's the institution of the law that being super is illegal in the second movie it's this big lawsuit reminder that superheroes are illegal regardless structurally it's the same then you have this you know second act like oh i guess we're out of the superhero business wouldn't it be great if we could be superheroes then a powerful character with unexplained money shows up saying i'm just a real fan of supers how would you like to do superhero work mm-hmm. we'd have to kind of do it outside of the law and they both did and then it's like oh there's a mysterious bad guy i wonder if it's the same people hiring them. Oh, wait. Yes, it is. Um, I had expected. I, I, I don't want to say expected. There was a part of me holding out hope like, wouldn't it be great if all of this was the primrose path that we were being led down by Pixar and they're going to do their Pixar trick of, of surprising us and, and showing us how none of this is is what we think it is. And they just didn't. And I don't want to say that makes it a bad movie. It's just an indication of, man, do I expect unfairly uh, superior greatness from Pixar. Yeah, mm. that that's tough for me to gauge because I didn't see the first movie. So I thought, yeah, you know what? That's probably who the bad guy was going to be. You really never set up a Chekhov's gun of it being anybody else. Um, th- th- so that that's weird. Was, was that a thing for you, Brian? Um, that one didn't bother me as much. Uh, I mean, yeah, now that you pointed out, it does kind of fit the same, <laughs> the same pattern. <laughs> Thematically, uh, I was actually just about to say uh, Bob Odenkirk's character is so Bob Odenkirk. I actually think the l- real life Bob Odenkirk is based on the cartoon version we saw in this film. Yeah, that that's another thing. Like for being a cartoon, they've not shied away from really just 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 outrageous shapes of heads and faces and bodies. And then all of a sudden, there's just like this exact photocopy of Bob Odenkirk's face <laughs> right, right. in there, which is a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah, because Elastigirl does not look like. Holly Hunter, uh, you know, none of the other characters look like like the actors are playing, but Bob Odenkirk nailed it. Uh, and, and, and I do want to heap a mountain of praise uh, as much as I I don't want to say resent, but was disappointed by the uh, by the, the big action beats and the thematic acts and whatever. I was hoping for something different than we saw in the first movie and we didn't get that. I will say that you did see a progression of even though technically it takes place a few days after the first movie, uh, it's very it clear that, really? that, 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 well, yeah, mm-hmm. because, yeah. because that oh, was op- that the opening fight, that opening okay. scene is the last mm-hmm. scene in the first movie. Ah, gotcha. So it goes straight, like, like the entire Incredibles one to Incredibles two is maybe a four week arc uh, oh, between the two. Yeah. Huh. The, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 but like seeing Violet move to from the early phases of teenage dumb to hardcore teenage dumb <laughs> as a dad and plus also yeah. I am a dad who in the last 2 years has seen my wife announce I'm going back to work you got to figure stuff out goodbye yeah. and then all of a sudden I I go from being the guy who's the star of the show touring all around America to now my job is to drive my daughter to school every day sure. like all of those beats were just delicious and wonderful and fantastic. So and I, I have I have a question about Incredibles one. How much of Incredibles one was like the everyday kids society stuff? Because I really liked that in this, and it made me think I could watch like an animated series about superheroes trying to live in mm-hmm. real life. And I don't know if that was uh, an influence of the first movie having a lot of that, or or you get you get. Um, uh, tell me if I'm right like on the kids. Yeah. yeah, tell me if yeah. I'm right on this, Brian. Uh, uh, yeah, you get a little bit of Dash pulling pranks, as you would expect mm-hmm. a seven or eight year old to do. You get a little bit of Violet being nervous about dating, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. about it. Really, the rest of the family aspect of the first movie, it's yeah. it's they don't say it. It's about somebody having a midlife crisis and and sure. uh, his wife suspecting he's cheating on her. And because mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah. I I liked the kid stuff, and and I kind of wish that had been fleshed out a little bit more to round out the whole family. Like it it, it didn't. It kind of dawned on me when he was like studying up on the math that like okay well dash is solved yeah like uh mm-hmm. i i 
I liked that. I liked those interactions, and I wanted even more of that. But I, I think it was. It's I enjoyed just seeing Violet Meltdown. Mm -hmm. That that hit close to home. Yeah. Uh, the uh, oh, doggone it! There's one other thing, and I've lost it. Oh, I, I I enjoyed all the nostalgia, like the fact that they played with the Outer Limits opening theme. Oh I, yeah. I, I don't know what oh, properties the... they had the rights to. Yeah. And the other themes that they do in the end credits. I mean, it, it's it's almost worth sticking around through the end credits to hear the old 50s style Elastic Girl and Mr. Incredible and Frozone mm -hmm. uh, cartoon themes. Yeah, uh, So all, all, all of Edna's stuff totally stapled on and unnecessary, mm -hmm. as best I yeah. could tell. There, there was yeah. no I reason for her to. I, I mean, it's great, but but you didn't see the first movie where she served a vital role and and had a reason for being there. This yeah. was just like remember her from the last movie. Now she's here again. Well, she made the tracker mm -hmm. for for uh, Jack Jack. Sure, the track track. But they mm -hmm. also had the tracker in all the costumes in movie one. It just felt if 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 uh, uh, I don't know. Well, okay. I mean, I mean, I mean I'm... Edna made an app, and Brian doesn't like the app. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I she was great. I, I, yeah. I like. Oh, 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 oh! This is what I want to ask. Okay. What? Uh, uh, who cried during the the short at at the opening? Oh, so so sweet. Yeah. Although, right. You know what made it better? Huh. Uh, somebody uh, tweeted me or posted on uh, the TMS chat or something saying, "Wow." The lady's husband actually found a male prostitute whose head looks like that dumpling to kind of ease her with the separation anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of it being her son <laughs> coming back, she, he found a male prostitute that, whose head looks like a dumpling. <laughs> that no, that's the story. That's what the story is now. All right, we're done. It. done. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. down to careful when you think of it that way. No, uh, I'll tell it you was, what, man. It was really beautiful when and when she ate the dumpling kid. It was like, oh, I, I'm wow. just uh, me and Bonnie and and Penny is finally over the threshold at, at 14. Penny's old enough to understand like, oh, this is my life and it's passing me second by second. And it's like all three of us just waterworks nonstop oh, yeah. the entire time. Yeah. It was great. It was, it was great. It was so good. It, it made me sad that. Coco did not have a short. <laughs> <laughs> it, it had a long at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. that awful long. With, with that frozen thing. Had either long or a no short. Let's yeah. Yeah. On, uh, when, you, when you waited to go see it. Uh, thumbs up? Yeah, oh, biggest, big, big, big thumbs up. I, I'd hate to say it, but but Incredibles 1 was, by every facet I can think of, superior to Incredibles 2. Although Incredibles 2 was a fun, fun ride, you know. I, I, I didn't regret seeing Iron Man 2, and uh, it was uh, weaker than the original, and so that's okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Goes cool. for all second movies, like Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> I kid. Don't have. I was broke. being careful in my words, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, real quickly, uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but let's ch chat about what we do in the shadows. Uh, the mockumentary of uh, it's it's really just a roommate comedy, except the roommates all happen to be vampires, and uh, you you get a little you know vampire versus werewolf, ha ha ha, and lot, lot, lots of turning stereotypes on their heads. But I think the the thing that I love about this movie is that it just never felt strained. It never felt like it was saying, and now we're making the vampire joke. It just felt natural, like, oh, yeah, this is what awkward vampires would be like. And, yes, they're mm -hmm. hundreds of years old instead of 20s. But I love the way they're like, oh, well, he's new. You know, he's young. He's only 130 <laughs> years old. So he still does these crazy things. And we've got the old guy in the closet who's a thousand, right. eight thousand years old or whatever. Uh, it just it was just so the tone was so well done. I adored the fact yeah. that they collapsed entire multi-decade genres of vampires into single characters. You have the Nosferatu. Mm -hmm. You have uh, uh, the uh, interview with the vampire. You have the uh, uh, and, and including uh, uh, the new guy who goes around just keep shouting Twilight. Hey, have you seen Twilight? Have you seen Twilight? That's me. I'm that guy. Right. It's like, geez, would you knock it off? What are you doing? I I, I thought it was great. <laughs> Yeah. Emmett, what do you think of what we did? If you can remember that far back, I know so far back. No, it. it um, this was a recommendation. Somebody uh, I was talking on again TMS about how I was just getting so sick of the typical current comedies. Sure, they're funny. Bridesmaids funny, you know uh, the the Apatow stuff. But it is always that kind of same element of this. Then pay it off with a gross out. Have somebody squat in the middle of the street after eating bad shrimp, whatever, and. Um, and after that comment, somebody said, you need to watch what we do in the shadows. It's a current comedy, doesn't follow that that same framework and completely loved it. Like, uh, 
and and as soon as I heard there was going to be a, a, a sequel with the with the werewolves and Riz Darby, Riz Darby, uh, I think? yeah, Riz Darby, who also Darby. is in uh, Voltron in uh, the Netflix show, uh, which you all should watch. He and- is great. <laughs> yeah, wear yeah. tear away clothes. You know, so so great. Yeah, it's uh, the, such a great. Uh, um, I watched it after seeing Thor Ragnarok and everyone's like, you're a bad person because you haven't seen it. And I enjoyed it so much <laughs> that I've actually held off on watching Hunt for the Wilder People, which I hear is also fantastic, oh. just because I realized there's only so many more early t- uh, Taika Waititi stuff left for me to experience for the first time. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to Deadwood. Uh, Ibit, you're going to stick with us for this, but you've seen yeah. all of Deadwood, so try I've not to spoil the end of it. Uh, we are at season three, episode two. I am not the fine man you take me for. In this episode, the candidates for sheriff and mayor deliver their campaign speeches. Swearingen uh, gets tortured a little bit by Hearst and then gets very angry. Doc Cochran is tending to Alma uh, as she is going through bad uh, labor things and Ellsworth fears she's going to die. And Jane talks about her exploits with Custer to the school children. Uh, finally, Andy has an uncomfortable reunion with Cy Tolliver, where Cy tries to be funny about the Bible and just ends up being weird. Okay, let's start with the worst parts of, parts of this. How did Cy, Cy, how did Cy go from being the best part of the show to the most useless appendage that has no <laughs> benefit whatsoever for existing on the show? None whatsoever. I don't know if Powers Booth just hated his contract and decided to torpedo every second he could on stage, but, but he I went. I don't from- know that it's it's just Powers. It's the things they're writing for him. Like don't make sense. I don't understand him calling this guy who shot him into the room and then being mocky bible with him. And then when he finally gets disgusted and leaves, like I would have done, there's no point. I don't get what he was after there. Uh, well, he was stabbed, not shot, but also, and, and he stabbed. was Sorry, uh, yeah. uh, waving the gun around the entire time. I... I deeply resent what they've done so far. It's it's this been is Tolliver's gun, unlike Chekhov's gun, <laughs> never gets fired. Either either they've been wasting my time with crap that doesn't matter, in which case I'm mad, or they take way too long to get to a place where something matters, in which case I'm still equally mad. Uh, there, there's no reason for Cy to be in any of this. Press pause on that. Everything <laughs> about Jane talking to the kids, adorable. So good. So good. Adorable. Loved all of she, it. She doesn't really want to start, but then she starts to see that they like it. Then she warms to the topic and she's getting into it. And yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So, so good. Uh, the, what do you think is going on in Swearingen's mind? He knows damn well why he's being summoned to Hearst. He knows damn well what Hearst is capable of doing and likely to do. He knows what Hearst's needs and instead, they have a factual, calm conversation about the nature of being a bending reed or of standing firm. And yep. he says, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stand firm. He's like, OK, well, here comes the part where I torture you. And he just puts up with it. And that scene, granted, it was electric for me to see Swearingen refuse to give any outward sign of the amount of pain he's in or the damage that he just suffered at the at the, at the hand of, of, of Hearst, but also it's unlike the swear engine we've seen the entire series up to this. We've seen a very practical man who knows which way the wind is blowing, occasionally needs to strut his stuff. We are seeing him act entirely out of pride this time. I, and and I don't, it seems- I don't know if it's entirely out of pride. I took it as a very good scene to show that swear engine isn't always right. He's not godlike and he underestimated Hearst. He, he, you're, you're not wrong about him knowing who Hearst is and what Hearst is, but he thought, and he even says a few things to this effect, he's the big shot from San Francisco. He's not going to want to, you know, uh, get, get into a tussle with me. Uh, so, so we'll talk factually and they talk factually and swear engine thinks it's going exactly the way he expected. He doesn't expect Hearst to cross that line and show that much backbone. He miscalculated. That's the way I took it. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. I, I could buy that. Um, I, I would say of the two, I'm going to use the word romances because I don't know what else to to call it. Uh, between Hearst and Swearingen, I was much more intrigued with uh, 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 Bullock and, and his missus. Like 
it really looks like they're starting to fall in for each mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. And the complication of Alma, by all appearances, dying right in front of them. And, and this almost permission, this between the lines talk where it's almost implied like, look, I know you have a thing for her and we as a unit will pray for her. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I thought all that was charming. And um, I e felt a little undercurrent that as Bullock helped her take care of her child from another man, granted Bullock's brother, she would be willing to do the same. Yeah. In other words, if Alma dies and the child goes to Bullock, she's fine with that. It's returning the favor and as the side benefit of getting rid of Alma, which I don't think she is being unchristian about and thinking that, but just so like, well, then that's one less problem to deal with. Well, and plus also we see uh, uh, what's what's the little girl? Uh, is it Sarah in the yeah. what, what's her name? I think it's Sophia, right? Sophia, that's what it is. Uh, I, we see her in the care, you know, because she's running the school or whatever. By the way, I can't decide if it's too over the top or right on the nose. The fact that all of the language lessons they're learning are super racist and of the 19th century. Where I was just curious like <laughs> if those are actually pulled from actual textbooks. I wouldn't be shocked if they were. I, I totally agree. I totally agree that's a possibility. Uh, but it, I'm not going to say it took me out of it. Uh, for example, it totally took me out of it when I started to try to watch Mad Men. And they were like, oh, misogyny. Oh, look, we're putting bags over our heads like it's a toy. Uh, uh, that that felt a little too clumsy, whereas this did not. Like, I believed it in that moment. So, Ibit, knowing yeah. where it's going and hearing <laughs> us talk, uh, how entertaining is this for you? It's very entertaining because I'm like trying to remember, oh yeah, uh, is that a, I can't remember that episode. And I can't remember, oh, did this happen to that character after or before this thing happened that they're describing? So I'm um, just being nice and cool and saying, oh man, Gerard so McCraney, what one, a great actor in this role. <laughs> one more note. Uh, they all, you have four speeches that are given. One of them really stood out from the rest. Uh, E.B. Farnham's speech running for mayor uh, without ever having said the word, <laughs> uh, uh, it was really, uh, I, 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 I certainly don't approve, but it was entertaining to see how his speech is. The other guy is a Jew. Please vote for me. Like, like, yeah. like all and, of the coy as, phrasing that he was using. As the audience continued to ignore his hints, he kept making them more and more, more obvious. More, <laughs> yes. Come it was, on. I'm trying to incite some race hatred and you're not playing <laughs> yes. along. Which which is interesting because I wonder if, uh, you know, Deadwood strikes me as the frontier society that would have a practical view of like, man, we don't have enough people to divvy him up into this many categories. Yeah. All we know is he's not Chinese and he's not an Indian. So it he's probably a okay. problem recently, then we don't need to use that right now. Like it's, you're just being selfish by using bigotry. It, it There's a time louder. and a place for bigotry, E.B. Farnham, and this is neither the time nor the place. He just gets louder and louder with it. It was, yeah. it was uh, extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> man, I would love to just chat with that actor about that character because that character is yeah. so disgusting and so awful and such a terrible person that I love to hate. I, 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 I wonder if as he's playing that character, he's able to find anything redeeming or to see it from his perspective, <laughs> or if instead he just from the beginning is like, I want everyone to hate this character as much as I hate this character. All right. Uh, Brian, but thank you so much for hanging out with us and spoiling stuff. Uh, my pleasure. It's uh, been a blast. You, uh, the, the thanks for inviting me. Go follow him on Twitter at Coverville. Anything else to tell people about before we let you go? No, Coverville uh, Twitter is the best place to to find all my shenanigans. I talk about everything else there. So uh, it's a great, great starting place. Excellent, my friend. Great having you along. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Take care. All right. Take care. Uh, and now we're going to catch up. We didn't get to talk about Preacher last week because Brian and I hadn't stayed up late to watch. And then I found out it actually does air at 7 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I was wrong about when it aired. Oh, that's so good. That means that means we'll be able to keep on up. doing this. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so it should be easy. Although I did watch it at 10 o'clock last night. Um, and episodes one and two kind of do run one into the other. Yep. Uh, we see mostly in episode one, him arriving at his grandmother's, some flashbacks about that, and then the effort to save uh, uh, Tulip. And then episode two is now that they've saved Tulip, we get a few more flashbacks, uh, especially right at the top of his life there. And, and more about 
the the men in white uh, coming and him trying to use that as a bargaining chip to get himself out of his grandmother's power. Uh, and of course, it doesn't work. So going in reverse order, by the end of the second episode, like we have that scene where he almost gets back the 1% of his soul that he uh, gave slash sold away or whatever. Um, I, I don't remember the specific moment uh, if they set this up one for one, but it seems like that's tied to him not being able to use Genesis, the fact that he has a corrupted, uh, incomplete soul. Yeah, it it does, and and even the placebo, the the genetically engineered placebo allows him to have the echoey voice apparently, but not actually uh, be able to use it anymore. Yeah. Um. Separate from that, uh, we also saw in the in the the we won't say afterlife in purgatory in the midlife, uh, uh, we see uh um uh what, what's her name Jewel what who uh, the chick's name. Uh, uh, tulip, 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 tulip. Oh, it's like Jewel, the singer. Yeah, oh, no, no, yeah. Tulip. Jewel yeah, shows yeah. up. She does some slam poetry. It's great. <laughs> uh, tulip, like, I, I really disliked all the way back twenty years ago, twenty plus years ago, in Ma Natural Born Killers, when they took serious matter and portrayed it as a, uh, uh, you know, a live action comedy scene uh, sitcom. But they did the same thing here, and I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved the pacing. I thought it was just the right amount. It wasn't heavy handed. It wasn't over the top. I was like, I get it. This is this is the way she perceives her and youth. The context makes it because it's like, oh, this is kind of a dream, right? Correct. And so th that makes more sense. Like, oh, yeah, well, a, a sitcom dream. Yeah, we probably all had an example of something close to that. Uh, what do you think of the introduction of, uh, his grandmother as, as, as this bad guy? Uh, does she feel like a big bad to you? Uh, I can't tell yet. Jury's still out for me. Um, I, I really liked her in the flashback scene when she was kind of the shadowy person that they, the, this elaborate system would usher someone in and you knew she was dangerous, but as long as you played by her rules, you were going to be okay. Like the guy, uh, who, who gets, uh, sober. By, by taking the potion and then he takes some whiskey and he can't stand it, right? Uh, I liked her then. Her as the sort of unbelievably decrepit person who needs souls and is aged and, you know, she'll be fine out in the graveyard in a wheelchair alone. I'm, I'm still waiting for something more to convince me that she's still a threat because other than the voodoo choking, we haven't seen her engage her powers here. Yeah, uh, two separate things. Uh, we have, of course, you know, the organization of Hairstar, uh, mm. which I feel like they kind of put on pause. I mean, certainly we've seen dust ups here or there, but I feel like that's not the real story. I wouldn't be surprised if we moved away from that for a little bit. We had that almost collapsing that narrative with him getting back his soul. But instead, we still have a weakened Jesse who has another mini boss that he has to fight. Um on the flip side, I'm really pleased with uh, triangles are a difficult dynamic to work and triangles work as long as all three sides are equally strong. And the fact that we've had we have Tulip who's gone to the other side and come back. So she's at arm's length for both of them because she's figuring out stuff on her own. And then I'm glad that they didn't wait because otherwise, if they hadn't done this, then it would have been too strong a connection between uh, Jesse and uh, uh, who's the vampire? Cassidy. Cassidy. Uh, between uh, Je uh, Jesse and Cassidy. But instead, right there in episode one, they're like, also, you know, she liked me enough to throw me a shag. Where it's just like, oh, now there's distance between the two. So we still have a triangle, but it seems equally strong on all three sides, which I think works narratively. Well, it, it seems is the operative word here, right? And that's what makes that beautiful moment work where I think Tulip says, I love you, man, to Cassidy. And Cassidy hears, I love you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, that's right. Uh, and, and it's like, oh, she doesn't mean what he thinks she means, and that's going to cause more problems. And that, again, that's what makes a good love triangle is misunderstandings and, you know, the dynamics always shifting between those three equally uh, strong sides. So, so I'm, I, I'm yeah, surprised looking forward and not looking forward to the the fallout from that. Oh, I, I am definitely looking forward to everything. I'm surprised that we're in the same location. I rather liked the idea yeah. that each season takes place in a different area. I and guess we so, just made that up. I guess it's not a really a thing. 
Uh, well, I, I, you know, maybe they'll decide to do that or not. I mean, it's, sure. um, you know, we I guess were, we started last season in Texas and made it to New Orleans, right? Or, or am yeah. I remembering wrong? Yeah. Um, uh, still waiing for them to go. Maybe, to little, maybe we started on the road and arrived. Go. No. Cause we started in Vegas. Yeah. We arrived in Vegas and then went to New Orleans. So yeah, maybe we'll still make it out of New Orleans. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, man. Um, <sighs> you're missing Hitler. No, no. Uh, <laughs> although yes, uh, I, I, <laughs> strange, strange as it may seem, uh, I, I am looking forward to picking up that thread again. Did, but- did you see in the credits where they mention Noah Taylor, who plays Hitler. Yep. Uh, they show him working a counter at a like a fast food shop with a tag that says Hilter. Oh, does it? That's amazing. I, I missed so that. He obviously is going to be in the real world. I, I, and I assume good. that means our space will as well. I, 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 I love that. Well, and you see our space in the uh, in the opening, you know, and in yep. fact, like yep. I've intentionally not looked real hard at that because I'm afraid of where my mind is going to go to try to predict uh, X, Y or Z. Um, the uh, oh, uh, I think I might have lost it. Um, the I, I will say that. Uh, I think it's crazy that uh, that that Tulip's experience of God is still in the dog suit <laughs> and he's got a command and he's still just like, that's just God wearing that crazy Dalmatian wants, suit. Uh, Dalmatian suit. <laughs> but he does. Oh, here's what I wanted to say. Uh, at a deep animalistic level, I was happy to watch Preacher in a way that I have not been happy for even one episode of watching Westworld. Westworld felt like homework. This felt like joy and fun and insanity. And if I didn't get it, I figured, ah, it's all gonna come out anyway. Like, like, uh, just, I don't know. It's, I, I'm excited for Better Call Saul to come back. I'm excited for Preacher. We're back to fun television, not this heavy handed beat you over the head with overly uh, heavy symbology out of sync time. I don't watch your homework. I wanna watch some TV. Well, and, and th- I agree with you there because when I watch Deadwood, I don't I know I won't always love the episode, but I always love sitting down to watch it. Right. Because I'm just like, you know what? I love I love the town. I love being here, you know, and, and so I'm going to enjoy it. Westworld is not a welcoming thing. It's not a world that I love to be in. Uh, and and Preacher and Deadwood uh, and Better Call Saul and others are, are worlds that I love to be in. They have varying levels of satisfaction story wise for me. Uh, and, and it comes and goes in all of them. Uh, but I love the world anyway. And, uh, and preacher has created a world where it's like, yeah, I just want to hang out with, with Jesse and Tulip and Cassidy for as long as I can. Yep. 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 Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you folks uh, for joining us and letting us spoil some stuff with you. I hope you like it. And if you do, please support us on Patreon. If you are a patron, you get spoiler in time early and a little bit of extra conversation between Bryce and Brian and myself at patreon.com slash court killers. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>